But there's been such a significant improvement in all those places that the resistance tends to... I mean, how many people are arguing for reversing the cannabis legalization here? You don't ever hear it now, right? I mean, there's been a little bit of a backlash and a kind of absurd book that's come out repeating the kind of Victor Lycarta style. Well, I actually had that guy on. Oh, really? Uh, Tell me about yeah. that. I didn't know that. Well, I had, we had a debate between uh, him and uh, Alex Berenstein and uh, Dr. Mike Hart from Canada. Um, and there's some there's some reality to the dangers of cannabis use with some people that are susceptible to schizophrenia. Um, and I think that there's also some at least anecdotal evidence that it points to the fact that some people experience these psychotic breaks and these schizophrenic episodes probably directly as a result of large dose use of THC, whether it's through edibles or whether it's through smoking. And some people freak out. I've known people, I've known of people that have had real issues with it. I mean, I had a comedian here a couple of weeks ago who talked about he doesn't smoke pot. He's from Brazil. He smoked pot. Uh, used a vape pen, uh, took a bunch of hits, and was fucked up for two weeks. There are there are p dangers and problems to yeah. certain people. So it's really important. The case for legalizing cannabis is not that there is no harm associated with cannabis, right? In the same way, the case for legalizing alcohol is not there's no harm associated course, with alcohol. Of course, but this is what uh, Alex Bernstein is trying to go over in his book. I don't think right. he did a good job f for right, right. two reasons. One, because he's basically only making the case for it to be negative. And I think there's far more evidence that cannabis has a positive influence on people. It reinforces community. It makes people more sensitive and kind. This uh, thought of paranoia might actually, it, it makes people more humble. Um, it makes sex feel better. It makes food taste better. There's, there's creativity aspects to it that are undeniable. There's a lot of very positive aspects to it. For some people, it's not good. But it's like saying, hey, some people die when they eat peanuts. Let's outlaw peanuts. I think warn your children about peanuts. Yeah, I think everything you just said is is absolutely right. I think there's another layer that's going on at the same time, uh, kind of below that, which is really important for people to understand. So there's this thing. Um, so very often people will say uh, you get kind of Republican politicians like Car I know Carly Fiorina saying it during one of the Republican debates in 2016 or 2015, maybe. Um, we can't legalize cannabis because it's much stronger now than it used to be. THC content has mm -hmm. gone up, people are smoking skunk. It's really important to understand why that happened. It's because of drug prohibition. So the day before alcohol was banned in the US, the most popular drinks by far were beer and wine, right? In the weeks after alcohol prohibition ended, most popular drinks again were beer and wine as they are today. In between, you could not get hold of beer and wine. The most popular drinks were whiskey and moonshine. You look at that and you think, well, why would that be? What's going on? Um, it's because of a kind of slightly wonky and boring thing, but I think it's worth talking about. It's called the Iron Law of Prohibition. If you imagine, if we had to smuggle the nearest bar to here, if we had to smuggle all the alcohol for that bar in a wagon from the Canadian, from the Mexican border, right, from Tijuana, um, in a wagon, we fill our wagon with beer, we're going to get drink for 100 people. If we fill it with vodka, we're going to get drink for thousands of people, right? So when you ban a drug and it has to be smuggled around, you get a premium on getting the biggest possible kick into the smallest possible space, right? This is why mild forms of the drug disappear. Before um, opiates were banned in the United States, most popular way of consuming it was something called Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, which you would buy in the pharmacy, right? Very low level of opiates. Most popular way of consuming coca-based products prior to the banning was Coca-Cola, right? It's called that for a reason. Uh, when the ban happens, heroin becomes the only form of opiates, powder cocaine becomes the only form of cocaine. In fact, when there's a huge crackdown on powder cocaine in the 80s, the iron law kicks in even more, and that's when crack is invented because you can get even more of a hit into an even smaller possible space, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to understand, if you want, it is not good. Most people who drink alcohol don't want to drink vodka, and they certainly don't want to drink absinthe most of the time, right? Most people want a mild form of their drug. That's true of cannabis. That's true. Of course, there's some people who want to get totally fucked up, either for fun or because they have addiction problems. But most people want a mild form of the drug. It's not good that mild forms of the drug are when they're not Let available. Let me stop you. Yeah. I don't think that's true. Uh, it's definitely not true in California. In California, what happened was medical ca cannabis got passed. And once medical cannabis got passed, there was uh, a, an emphasis on the strongest possible stuff because people wanted it. 
I mean, it was a direct result of people having higher tolerances because marijuana was so readily available. And they, if you have a high tolerance and you smoke a lot of pot, you want strong pot because weak pot doesn't do anything. It's the number one complaint amongst cannabis enthusiasts is yeah. someone having weak pot. So you've got a subculture of people who are cannabis enthusiasts. Yes. Who, who, who do, you're right. There's a sub, just like there's a subculture of people who want vodka or absinthe, right? But, but I don't think it's a, a, a matter. It's not the same thing. Like gin, obviously, is more potent than whiskey or than beer rather it's easier to carry gin around you have to carry less of it with cannabis people are still buying the same quantity well, they're just I getting more fucked up because their tolerances are so much higher they need the stronger and stronger thc so as you have a legal market you can have a variety of options yes. right you, what you have is what we'll what we'll discover i think as time goes by because we know it's with alcohol is different people want cannabis to do different things. You're totally right. There's some people who want maximum THC, maximally fucked up. Just like some people who well, want there's still a market for, for lower grade weed. I mean, they have it listed at all these yeah. dispensaries. They have it listed, you know, 20%, 35%. They have it listed. So you can choose a more mild marijuana if you like to. But the OG people, the people that do it every day, of course, they want that really potent weed. Yeah. It's not like... But I would say they're more like the people in Vegas who gamble, are professional gamblers, versus the people who go to Vegas for the weekend and just want to play a roulette. Well, there's mm -hmm. definitely a concentrated market of very dedicated users who want to get maximally fucked up. You're totally right. Yeah, I think that's what pushed the... I mean, it's also in botanists. I and mean, I'm friends with a bunch of people who breed and grow these various strains. But if you think about... So, Professor David Nutt has done really interesting work on this. So, if I remember rightly, there's 38 active components in cannabis, right? So, ca cannabinoids. Well, there's hundreds of cannabinoids. Yeah. So, I, I, I think the if I remember from Professor Nutt's work, the, the, he, he argues there's 38 kind of significant active components. Uh, maybe other people... Yeah, I think there's findings. over 100 uh, cannabinoids. I think we just discussed this, right? right. Didn't we, uh, so, yeah. uh, one of the things he argues, and I'm happy to be corrected on the specific number, but one of the things he, he argues... Um, is you've got, because you were talking about schizophrenia and psychosis, mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to understand, there is some evidence that very high exposure to THC in a small number of people can can lead yes. to psychosis, right? And that's even a small number of people where you have a very widely used drug, is, is that's really problematic, right? But actually, but this is really interesting evidence. So why do people who are prone to psychosis and schizophrenia want cannabis right there, there is a lot of them who want it it's not that people no hardly anyone wants to have a psychotic episode it's actually so thc um uh correlates with with psychosis in some people but there's a, a, another component of cannabis called cbd uh cannabidiol which actually we know there's good evidence soothes psychosis and schizophrenia right it's actually given as a treatment in some places uh, in distilled pill form so actually it's a slightly more complex picture than Cannabis causes psychosis, right? Very rich THC in some people will cause psychosis. That's a real problem. There are things we can do to, to prevent that. And one of the good things about a legal market is you can regulate it. So we can limit the amount of THC that is available, just like we can limit, you know, you can't go and buy 70% proof alcohol. Mm -hmm. But also what, what, what Professor Nutt has been arguing is we need to be, and they exist, but they need to be commercialized and promoted more um, or promoted in a public health way, not necessarily commercially. Um, CBD rich cannabis will actually be helpful to people with psychosis and schizophrenia. So it's a slightly more complicated pitch. I know that you, you, you're you not saying that it, in a, you're not endorsing what um, the tell your kids guy, what's he called again? Um, the guy who did your debate. Um, Alex who, Bernstein. Yeah. Uh, I know you're not endorsing the kind of simplistic view on either side, but the, the um i think it's slightly more slightly more complicated than that the other thing i think is really worth saying though to people is there's one thing we we all do agree on which is um cannabis is bad for young teenagers right it's yes. bad for developing brains there was one person i interviewed who really helped me to again to think about this a guy called fred martins who's in i went to go and see him in camden new jersey and fred was a cop he's retired now but he was a cop it was a really kind of right wing. It reminded me of the Clint Eastwood character in Dirty Harry. He's not a liberal, right? And he had this, he wouldn't use a fancy word like this, but he had an epiphany about drug legalization one day. He was in a car park in Wayne, New Jersey in 1971. He was staking out a dealer. He's in plain clothes, obviously. And a kid comes up to him, like an 11 year old or something, and goes, Hey, mister, um, I'm not allowed to buy alcohol. Will you go into that liquor store and buy some for me? And Fred goes, No, get out of here. So the kid walks over to the drug dealer and buys some drugs from him instead. And Fred has this kind of realization, which is, oh, he wouldn't put it this way, but 
Legalization puts a regulatory barrier between kids and drugs that doesn't currently exist, right? This is why, since they legalized cannabis in Colorado, there's been a, don't want to overstate it, it's not huge, but there's been a significant fall in teenage cannabis use, right? Drug dealers don't check ID. Licensed legal businesses do. They really care if they're, because they, they've got something to lose, right? Mm-hmm. So I think if sometimes it's used as the kind of protect our kids argument is used as a case for prohibition. In fact, if you want to protect your kids, you should be putting a big premium on getting these substances out of the hands of armed criminal gangs and into the hands of licensed legal businesses. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to argue that. I mean, I think that anybody rational, rather. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that um, there, the number of people that have schizophrenia is fairly it's fairly stable in terms of the percentage of it across the board, cannabis users or non-cannabis users. And so the argument against this idea that cannabis causes schizophrenic breaks is that these people already have schizophrenia and it just hasn't really manifested itself in a, in a a tangible sense. So this is one of the things professor Nutt says. So there's, there's, there is some evidence that, uh, cannabis, uh, a small number of people causes psychosis. There's a study in Sweden that showed this. With schizophrenia, it's much more contested. Mm. So, so psychosis versus schizophrenia. What yeah. What's the major distinction? Yeah, I've not researched this in depth, but um, psychosis involves um, they're, they're different. Phenom- yeah, they're and different paranoia. phenomena. Paranoia. Yeah, schizophrenia is a subset of mental illness that's very specific. Right. Has a significant genetic component, although there can be environmental triggers for it. So it could possibly trigger both. It could possibly trigger psychosis and well, schizophrenia. The argument against that, so professor, so there is evidence with psychosis. The argument, I want to stress, it's a very small number of people, but it is real. Um, uh, and, and there are things we can do in a legal market to counteract that that are much harder to do in a prohibited market. But with schizophrenia, the argument against that, and I've not looked into this in a huge amount of detail, so I don't want to, this is not, I don't say this with the same degree of confidence I've been saying the other stuff, but um, Professor Nutt argues, well, we know that cannabis use has massively increased in Britain, for example. I think it's something like 20-fold increase since 1960 in Britain. And yet levels of schizophrenia have remained the same. If cannabis was causing schizophrenia, you would expect it to vary with cannabis use, at least to some degree, there'd be some relationship. And uh-huh. that doesn't seem to be the case. So again, I, that's what Professor Nart, who's the former chief scientific advisor on drugs in Britain, says, I haven't looked into that in great detail, so I, but I, he's basically right on all the things that I have looked into that he says. Hmm. Um, I, do they know what the mechanism would be that would cause someone to consume THC and have a psychotic break? Have that, has that enough. been examined? I don't know enough about it. That would I, seem I to be a big issue, right? Like find out what it is that's causing this trigger and whether or not this exists in these people anyway and maybe a stressful situation, a bad breakup, losing their job, maybe one of those things could also cause this trigger. 